As the title indicates, tonight we're here to be talking about bugs and presenting will be my master gardener colleague, John Fike, and he's going to be taking you into the fascinating world of insects. We'll be talking both about um, the bad bugs and also some of those beneficial bugs or the good bugs that we find in our home landscape, whether it be in the air or under our feet in the soil, tucked away under leaves or hiding in our gardening boxes. They're everywhere. And we're very excited to be able to share a little about their biology, lots of beautiful pictures. So you could become more intimately um, familiar and knowledgeable about these friends some of them good, some of them bad. Um, so we're very excited to um, be presenting this information with, to you this evening. And um, no one can do it better than John Fike and a little bit about him. He spent 34 years on the faculty at UCSF after he retired from academia. He soon after went through the Master Gardener training and um, has since been a very active volunteer. He currently leads our Ask a Master Gardener program, co-leads it, uh, which are the tables. If you've ever been at farmer's markets or other places in the community, you could ask us Master Gardeners about questions. He is also very active in our Speakers Bureau, which presents um, talks like tonight's program. And he is also on our executive leadership team for our organization. John is very passionate about biology and specifically about introducing science and in our gardening landscape in a fun way so that all of you can be enchanted and fascinated and kind of very curious about what's around you. So to do that, I'm going to give the floor over to John and let him start his wonderful talk. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Andrea. You that bet. Was a very gracious introduction. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here and have the opportunity to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is insects. And many of you are probably going, what, is this guy nuts? And if you ask my family members, maybe they, they'd say yes, but I'd like, I prefer to use the word passionate about a, a subject that may be... We don't know too much maybe are that interested in, but I'm hoping that by the end of this, you will be interested in it. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna give a little bit of biology, not heavy stuff, but stuff that's really important to understanding the quote, goodness or the badness, unquote, of insects. Um, and then we'll talk about some bad bugs and we talk about some good bugs and um, uh, just try to get a, at the very least, I hope you learn some interesting fact about new facts about insects. And at the very most, I hope you get a different appreciation for these creatures that share our ecosystem with us. So let's get started. I was um, fortunate enough about a year, year and a half ago to, uh, to go to Egypt. And on the wall of the tomb of Ramses IV was this. This uh, dated from 1150 BC. And what it is, is a scarab beetle called a dung beetle. It's called a dung beetle. And what dung beetles do is they lay their eggs in little balls of animal dung or mud. And then they balance on their front feet and walk backwards, uh, rolling the ball with their rear feet. And the ancient Egyptians likened this to the movement of the sun across the horizon. So they made him a deity. So there's a... Uh, a, a scarab deity by the name of Kepri, and he works with the main sun god, Ra. And my whole point of this is, in, the, in human experience, if you look at historical writings, theological writings, scientific writings, or in the walls of ancient Egyptian tombs, you see that insects play a role in the overall narrative. And that, I think, in and of itself makes them worthy of consideration. So that, I hope, uh, is, is a good pre uh, prelude to what we're going to uh, talk about today. So what is an insect? Now, there's a field of, of science called taxonomy, and it's just where scientists characterize and classify and name animals or plants. And this is the taxonomy of the insect. Now, they are in the animal kingdom, which is not surprising. The next uh, subset down is called a phylum and it's called Arthropoda. And if I'm sure many of you remember your Greek, which uh, Arthropoda means jointed toe. All the arthropods have big, heavily jointed 
uh, legs, and they have a, a hard exoskeleton. That skeleton is on the outside of the body rather than the inside like ours. So what do you, you're probably going, what does that mean? Well, think about a Dungeness crab or a lobster or a crayfish. They have a shell, that's their outer, that's their exoskeleton, the skeleton outside their body, and they have big old um, uh, jointed legs. Um, so crabs and lobsters are arthropods, spiders are arthropods, and insects are arthropods. Within the insect class, there are 30 orders. Why is that? Well, a flea is different than a grasshopper that's different than a butterfly that's different than a wasp that's different than a beetle. And within those 30 orders then are uh, more subdivisions called families because not all butterflies are the same. But what it really boils down to is this last number. And that is there, are, as of right now, there are one, about 1 million defined species of insects, individual uh, specific insects. The people that seem to know a lot uh, more than I do, they think that's an underestimate. There'd be two or three million individual types of insects. So that means that there's a lot of them. And actually, if you take all the plants and all the animals in the world, by number, insects represent over half of them. Now, you notice I use the word multicellular in there, not to confuse you, but I'm excluding bacteria and viruses. We know all too much about viruses right now. My point is there's an awful lot of insects out there. And actually a lot of people have, have done a lot of work and calculations to try it. How do they tell people who aren't scientists and don't care to study that, how many there are? That brings us to our first little poll that Andrea is going to help us with, I hope. Yes, I am. All right. I'm going to read this poll to you. This is a fun one. So you see there's a little picture there with John on the scale and a question mark. So the question out there is not what's in the bag, but someone out there estimated the number of pounds of insects per pound of human being on earth. Given that estimate, what is the weight of bugs equivalent to John's weight? You could go ahead and cast your vote and I'll read the choices. The first one is less than a ton. The second one is two tons. The third choice is five tons, or is it over 10 tons? You guys are voting really fast. We've got about a third of you voted. So I'm gonna leave a few seconds open for everyone to get in their best guess. And then we'll I'll pass it back to John and share what everyone thinks. All right, just a few more seconds. Looks like we have about three-fourths of the folks voting. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you for taking your guess. And I'm going to share the results. So it looks like 10% of you thought less than a ton, 14% two tons, 31% guessed five tons, and 46% thought it was over 10 tons. So I'm going to close, stop sharing the results, and I'll hand it back to John to share what the right answer is. Okay, it's over 10 times you're right. Now, the, the calculation is based on somebody with far too much time on his or her hands, so 300 pounds of insects per pound of human being. Now, please don't try to calculate my weight. I know I kind of look prosperous over here, but I've lost some weight. So anyway, so it's 28.5 tons are equivalent to me in that with, based on that calculation. That's kind of hard to imagine. Till you look at the number that was estimated by the Smithsonian about a year or two ago, and there are 10 quintillion individual insects alive. Now a quintillion is a billion billion. That's really a lot. And because there's a lot, they're the most diverse of the animals uh, uh, diverse group of animals in the, in the world. I mean, there are big ones, there are small ones, there are fast ones, there are slow ones, there's brightly colored ones, there are drab ones. There's the ones that fly, ones that swim, ones that crawl, ones that hop, ones that eat plants, and ones that eat animals. This is a tiny montage of what I think are really beautiful insects, and it gives you just an idea of the wide range of looks and colors, and I think they're really, uh, really pretty, but there's an awful lot of insects. So what distinguishes an insect? I think everybody 
sitting in here knows, well, insects have six legs, and that's correct. In contrast to arachnids like spiders or mites that have eight legs. Well, an insect has a head and it has antenna, it has a thorax right here. Underneath this brightly colored top is an abdomen. And um, the exoskeleton, as I mentioned, is this, this structure here. It's called an elytra on a beetle. And I only reason I'm giving you that because I mentioned it a time or two. Uh, it's a hard covering, part of the exoskeleton. When this beetle, surprisingly enough, called a zigzag beetle, when it takes flight, the elytra open up and the wings come out. But these are the characteristics of, of, the, uh, of the insect and the, the six legs as, as opposed to the eight. Now, this is my, see how fast we went through the science. This is my last part of the science, but it's really very important to the topic. And that's the idea of metamorphosis. I think probably everybody listening in at one time or another in their life has been exposed to the concept of metamorphosis. We either got it in elementary school or middle school or high school or maybe later. And metamorphosis is a development and it's a very rapid and abrupt change from egg to adult where the immature phases generally do not look like the mature one. Uh, that's why we don't go undergo metamorphosis. Our, our little tiny ones look like us. Uh, but in, um, in the lower animals, metamorphosis is really important. And we all learn it based on frogs or toads, where the frog lays the eggs in the water, and then the tadpole, is, or I learned it as polywog, uh, develops, and it has gills uh, to help it breathe in the water. Uh, it starts to develop lungs, it starts to develop rear legs, it starts to res uh, resorb its tail as its front legs come out. And after a couple of months, out pops a little tiny frog or toad. And so the changes are, are very dramatic um, and uh, relatively rapid. And so insects undergo metamorphosis too. And, they, and there are two versions of it. Complete metamorphosis as follows. The adult is at the top, lays her eggs, uh, at the three o'clock position. And then the eggs hatch in what is called a larva. The larva doesn't look anything like the adult. The larva spends its time eating whatever it eats, plants or animals or whatever. Then it finishes its development by forming a pupa. If it was a um, uh, moth, it would be a cocoon. If it was a butterfly, it'd be a chrysalis. But that's the same thing. They're all pupil cases. And then out pops an adult. This is complete metamorphosis. Well, partial metamorphosis, I always like this, this definition to go, well, it's exactly the same, but different. The eggs are laid by the adult. The eggs now hatch into what are called nymphs, and they're called instar nymphs. They kind of look like mom, but not really. They don't have the wings. They don't have fully structured. And as they go from instar one to two to three to maybe five, uh, they, they shed their outer skeleton, and they get bigger and bigger, they get closer to mom, and finally they end up looking like mom or dad. Now, you sit there and go, oh, that's great, but why? Why do we care? Well, we care for this reason, is that whether we're talking about a good bug or a bad bug, it's usually, but not exclusively, but usually these immature forms that are doing the goodness or the badness. It's not the adults necessarily, it's the babies. Let me give you a perfect example of that. This is the monarch butterfly. Everybody loves the monarch butterfly. And um, uh, they're beautiful to watch fly around. They're pollinators. They eat only uh, the nectar or pollen out of the flowers. And so they're very benign in that. They're a good thing. We love to see them. Now, whether it's a monarch or another type of butterfly or a moth, what do they do? They lay their eggs. And what do the eggs turn out to be? Larva. We call those larvae caterpillars. Now, if you're growing milkweed in your garden in order to maintain the monarchs, that's one thing. But if you're growing lettuce or broccoli or cabbage or tomatoes, maybe those caterpillars are not what you want in the yard. And it's the immature forms that are doing the damage. So that's the point of all this metamorphosis business is, is you need to kind of understand in a general sense how insects develop because it has a very dramatic effect on their goodness or their badness. So a couple of general considerations. 
most people probably wouldn't argue this case is that if you have a bunch of pests, this can have a bad effect on your garden, whether it's a veggie garden or a annual garden or a perennial garden or a, 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 a fruit tree orchard. Um, if you don't have the natural predators, the good bugs, the good guys, pretty much is ensured that you have a minimal defense against high pest levels. So what have we done because of that over, over the years? Well, we've used broad spectrum in insecticides, but they kill everything. They ki they're very effective and they kill good guys and they kill bad guys. And what's happening now, maybe it's more relevant to big ag than home gardening, but still some insects are now showing resistance to chemical pesticides. So what do we do in that case? Well, we make new, new uh, compounds, which could be even nastier. Now, this is not an anti-pesticide talk, but chemicals are chemicals. And, and so um, uh, we need to be aware of that. And so what, what my, my plea is, is we need to know more about the enemy, the bad guys, and, and the good guys, your friends. So let's let the good guys do the heavy work for us. But... In order to do that, you have to, to define a tolerance level for yourself. Is a little bit of damage okay? Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So I'm working at a farmer's market table in Walnut Creek last year, and this gentleman walks up with a jar full of these and a jar full of these. These are leaf-footed bugs, and they're called leaf-footed bugs because of this protrusion on their back leg. And these are the nymphs. These are the babies. So he comes up to me and he says, he hands them to me and he goes, what do I spray on these guys to get them off my blueberry plant? So the first question was, um, are you getting blueberries at all? Well, yeah, I'm getting all I can eat. Ah, I see. And the plant, how does the plant look? The plant looks great. So my point is, they were an annoyance to him. They really weren't doing anything uh, bad, or they weren't destroying his blueberry plant or the, the fruit, they just annoyed him by being there. Now, what I can't say is if they stayed there and got to higher and higher levels, would they finally start damaging the plant? Maybe. But the point is at that point, at that point in time, they were just an annoyance to him. So that's what you have to do. Can you accept a little bit of a few pests or do you have to get rid of 100% of them? And if if you need to get rid of most of them, if you need to do more drastic measures, and that means insecticides and so forth, my plea is to use the least toxic alternative. So now let's get to the bugs. And here's just another montage of just more interesting looking, beautiful creatures, I think. Um, maybe I'm a little bizarre on that, but I think they're really neat to look at. So how do you know who the good ones are and who the bad ones are? I mean, there's, there's really no way to know it's strictly based on appearance. And here's the, I'll give you a couple examples of this. You remember I mentioned the elytra, which is that hard covering of the exoskeleton of the beetle. Well, all three of these beetles have brightly colored spotted elytra. So if your criterion for goodness or badness was brightly colored spotted elytra, you would likely not get it right because this one's good and these two are not good. And if you go out there now, we're down at the end of the season, but you could go out there in your cabbages or your melons or something, you might find this guy. Um, he's around, uh, they get in roses, they get in flowers, they're all over the place. They can cause some damage, mainly to younger plants, but they're out there. Let me give you another example. These two are called true bugs. You remember when I mentioned that there was a 30 orders of insects because they're different. Well, there's one order of insects that are called true bugs, even though I use the term for all of them, bug. Um, these are true bugs. And remember I mentioned the elytra, the cover over the wings? Well, the true bugs only have a partial, a hemi-elytra, this part, where the wing is exposed here and here. So if you came to me and you said, um, there is a brown to gray oblong looking insect with orange to red highlights, is it good or bad? I couldn't tell you. Because this one's good. This is an assassin bug. He eats other bugs, preferably bad ones. And this guy, 
is bad. Well, he's not a really bad pest unless you're a box elder tree and then he can cause some damage. But my whole point is just by, you see that they're different by looking at them side by side, but if you don't have them side by side, you can't just make a conclusion based on color or shape. Here's another one. The one on the left is the earwig, very common around here. They get into everything. They do some good things. They eat some fungus and some dead things in the ground, but they also eat your baby plants and they can cause a lot of, of if they have high numbers, they can, they can cause a lot of damage to young plants. Um, so this is definitely considered a bad bug, but this one who looks roughly the same. I mean, a lot of similarities there. He's a good guy. He eats the, the, the immature forms of the bad bugs in the soil. So you kind of have to know which is good and which is bad. Here is my last one. Uh, this are, are mealybugs. Mealybugs are, are a sucking insect. They suck the juices out of your plants, out of your succulents. They can be a real mess. And um, there is a, a, a small beetle that's related to the lady beetle. It's called a mealybug destroyer. And this is her baby. It looks very much like a mealybug. My whole point is you kind of have to know some of the goods and some of the bads. Given the numbers I said early on, there's no possible way that anybody can remember all the good ones or all the bad ones. But there are some basic ones we're gonna go over shortly that hopefully will be uh, helpful. And that brings us to our next poll. Andrea? All right, thank you. So look at this cute little guy. Our next poll is gonna have you give your best guess. Let me grab it up. Hopefully everyone can see that. Look at that cute face, right? What do you think? Is this insect praying mantis? Is it a good bug, a bad bug, or is it kind of in the middle? Is it neutral? Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Give you a few minutes, a few seconds, I guess I should say. Cast your vote. Got people really like this question coming in fast. Give a little bit more time to answer. Okay, it looks like everyone who wanted to answer is answered. So I'm gonna end the poll and I'll share the results. So it looks like 62% of you took a guess that it, this is a good bug. 5% guessed it's a bad bug and a third of you, 33% thought it was neutral. I'll go ahead and turn it back over to John who's gonna tell you which of them it is. Okay, I would say the praying mantis is neutral and here's why. This is a picture of him doing something really good. Most of us don't like flies that much. So here he is, here or she is eating this fly. So you'd say, ah, there, that, that, that's proof. It's a, it's a good bug. Here's a picture I took last year in my uh, uh, garden with the marigold. This is a big female praying mantis. And what's she eating? Hope you can see it. I'll tell you if you can't see it. It's a honeybee. Well, a honeybee is one of our friends. So I would say that the, she's acting kind of like a bad bug here. And then there's this. A scientific study was uh, done a couple of years back. And there were 147 documented cases of the praying mantis taking a small bird. Their preference is hummingbirds. And you can actually Google that and look and you'll see some really astonishing pictures. So two of the three pictures I show uh, I would I would say would be in my bad category. One would be in the good. Uh, while they're fascinating to watch, a praying mantis will eat absolutely everything it, it can reach. And of course, uh, when they uh, when they mate, the female about thirty percent of the time, the female will eat the male right after they are finished. So it's a complicated one. So let's go to the bad bugs now. This is a beauty, isn't it? Anyway, uh, what I mean by bad bugs in the context of this talk are the common pests that you likely have had in your garden or you will have. We're towards the end of the season now, but still, you, you, there still are some bad guys out there. First of all, they're aphids. I think everybody knows aphids. They are a real uh, problematic creature. Uh, there's seemingly gazillions of them if you go out one day and there's none and the next day they seem to be everywhere. They are a true bug. They're one of the true bugs and they are a sucking insect. They have a uh, mouth part that they pierce uh, the leaves or the stems or the flowers and they suck the juice out, can cause 
um, the plants to become uh, wilted and, and they can cause a lot of damage. Um, there's a couple of interesting factoids about aphids and one of which is females can reproduce without males. This is a process called parthenogenesis. It's not the only insect or creature on earth that does that, but it's, it's a major player in, in this. And in contrast to many of the other insects, the aphid a female gives birth to live young, almost all of which are females. So five to seven days after she gives birth to this, this one, who is a likely female, will start giving birth to more females. So that's why you can go from that, well, there are just a few to they seem to be overrunning the garden. And you can wash them off, you can treat them with oil or insecticidal, so you usually can control them that way. But I'll show you the biological control measure, measures in a little while. There's a variety of insects called scale insects, and there's a lot of them. This one is called a cottony cushion scale. This is a brown soft scale and a black scale. You can just see in these three, they have different appearances. Uh, this white uh, part, th those are egg sacs. They're just filled with little pink crawlers, which are the baby of the nymphs and eggs. Um, this is the more common one probably that you'll see around the brown soft scale. Um, their exoskeleton, remember the skeleton's on the outside, is like a shell over the insect. Um, they don't move around as adults. The only time they move around is when they, uh, sh uh, shortly after they are, are born, and they're called crawlers. I don't know, these little white dots around here, up here, 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 those are called crawlers, and they're the most vulnerable to any kind of um, uh, horticultural oil or uh, insecticidal soap is when they're crawlers. You can have some luck against the adults, but sometimes they can be very problematic. Sometimes, like I've had with citrus, I'll have a, a small limb that is just loaded with them and I just have to cut it off and, and throw it away. And sometimes uh, you just have to do that. Scales and aphids and uh, mealybugs are all um, sucking insects. And when they suck the juices out of the plant, they then excrete a sticky substance called honeydew. It's shiny, it's sticky, and it's the perfect growth medium for what's called black sooty mold. So sometimes you'll see on your citrus other plants, it's just ugly with black mold because the scales or the aphids uh, excrete all this honeydew and the mold gets going. It doesn't really hurt this, but you wouldn't want to put this on your morning buffet tray, would you? You know. Anyway, so that's one of the side effects to the sucking insects is the black sooty mold. Another side effect is another one of the bad bugs called the Argentine ant. This is the little black ant that's everywhere. And they do a few good things in, in the garden. They'll eat some old dying or dead stuff. But what they do is they farm scales, mealybugs. You see an ant here uh, farming the mealybugs or aphids. They actually will move aphids around a plant to this, uh, the tender uh, new growth, which is more tender for them to, to pierce and to produce their honeydew. The ants take the honeydew back to their nest to feed their own uh, babies. So if you have the sucking insects like aphids or mealybugs or scale, you almost certainly will have ants. So you have to control the ants while you control these others. There are a whole variety of beetles that could be uh, considered bad guys, bad bugs. The elm leaf beetle just shreds the leaves of the elm tree, leaving this detritus like ash as we know now. It looks like ash all over your uh, car or your patio. Uh, the, uh, the potato beetle uh, chews up potato plants and others. The striped cucumber beetle uh, is similar to its uh, cousin, the spotted cucumber beetle. and um, uh, you could go out and find these right now if you have any cucumbers or squash left. The green fruit beetle uh, usually goes to overripe fruit, but not always. So you have a nice ripe peach, maybe you wouldn't want to eat it after seeing this guy on it. The hoplia beetle uh, eats uh, rose petals and he prefers white or apricot colored ones. So if you don't want this, plant a red rose. It's kind of an interesting little thing. And this last one I put on there because he's a neat looking beetle. He's called a snout beetle, 
for obviously reason. He's actually a bull weevil, which is not really a big player uh, for home gardeners. Although the bull weevil is now uh, agriculture has become more uh, significant because we have a big uh, vibrant cotton industry in California. So beetles have quite a number of, uh, there are quite a number of what you consider bad guys because they eat your stuff. Then we have the five spotted hawk moth. It's also called a sphinx moth. Um, you can see a couple things on this picture besides these blue lines, which I don't know what they are. Um, this is the five spots of the moth. So the moth, uh, two things you see, that I see when I look at this picture is the moth is really big and this person might need a manicure, but I won't get into that. The moth eats pollen or nectar, um, but what does its baby eat? Aha, this is its baby. This is the tomato hornworm. And I took this picture yesterday because I took this big guy off my tomato plant and put it down on the, um, on the hillside where I had some mulch and stuff just so I could get a good, good sideway glance. But this is the big one and he does a lot of damage to your tomato plants. He eats the fruit and the leaves and the stems. When he's ready to, uh, to finish his development, he forms a chrysalis down in the soil. And if you pick this, guy, this thing up by this little handle here, it'll squirm around on you. Some people don't like the thought of that. So this is once again showing that it's the immature form, not the mature adult form that's the problematic issue. If you have uh, apples or pears or walnuts in the county, you will have coddling moth. It's just a fact, they're everywhere. Coddling moths are small. They come out and mate when the temperatures are 62 to 65 degrees. And then they lay their eggs on the apple or the pear or the walnut, on the leaves, on the stems. The eggs hatch and the larva burrows into the apple. And this, the stuff here, it's called frass. It's the excrement of the, of the uh, larva as it crawls down into the apple. Sometimes they crawl in through the uh, blossom end here. And then you see this. And uh, so the damage by the worm is in the core and, and, in, and the hole that it crawled through and all that brown stuff is fungus and stuff that grew in there because of the excrement of the worm. Now, when I give this talk, uh, uh, I have given it a couple times before at libraries and people are horrified when I say, there's nothing wrong with this apple. I mean, this big part is fine. This part, this part. So you could make applesauce, you could eat it. You could make apple pie out of it. You just cut the worm out of it. Uh, some people can't do that. Um, but this is that tolerance level. If half your apples have worms and the other half don't, could you live with that? Um, because if you want to try to, to manage uh, the coddling moth, it's not a trivial thing. You have to do calculations based on temperature, uh, uh, readings, and um, all sorts of things. And then you have to spray at certain times and you have to repeat the spray. So it's not a trivial thing. You can do it, but it's a lot, uh, a lot of work. So, but if you have 500 apples and you could eat 250 of them, maybe it's okay. White flies are uh, a real menace. Uh, some years are really bad, other years are not. Um, this is the underside of a leaf where you just see a whole bunch of them. These are the adults and these are the nymphs. And uh, they're hard to control with uh, most anything. Um, uh, they're difficult. The oils or soaps will suffocate the, uh, uh, the nymphs but have no effect on the uh, adults because they'll fly away. Uh, you might be wondering why the oils and, and the soaps work because insects breathe through little holes in their sides called spiracles. And if they clog up with oil or, or soap, then you suffocate them. And that's how those work. Sometimes if you have a bad white fly infestation, uh, you have to um, uh, pull the plant and throw it away. It's just, it's, they're very difficult to control, but there are biological controllers. I'll mention that shortly. Here's our last poll. I'll turn it back over to Andrea. Thanks, John. All right, so looking at this beautiful tomato, we do notice a little discoloration. So this last poll is gonna be testing, asking your knowledge about that. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. So the question is, take a look at this picture of this tomato. Which of the following does discoloration on this tomato represent? 
Is it from a snail or slug activity? Could it be from a virus or maybe insect activity? Or possibly is it watering issues? Go ahead and take a few seconds and click and submit your response and uh, we'll see what everyone thinks. And I wanna give a shout out to the people on the YouTube live streaming. We love that you're uh, putting in your, your uh, responses to our poll questions too. So thanks for participating. That's great. Okay, it looks like about a little over 80% of you have participated and it's slowing down. So I'm gonna end the poll and share with you what everyone thought. So 1% thought could be a snail or slug. 37% thought it's a virus, which was our most common um, selection. 27% uh, thought insect activity and 35% thought it might be watering issues. John, what is the right answer? Well, I thought maybe more people would get the insect activity since this is a talk <laughs> on insects. Um, it is insect activity. So you go, well, what kind of insects, John? Well, I'll tell you, they're called stink bugs, the green stink bug or the conspire stink bug, both of which uh, are found in, in the central county. Uh, green is more central valley. These are true bugs. Remember the true bug, the hemiolytra with the wings showing. And this gives a perfect example of the mouth parts of the, um, of the bug. And they get on that tomato and they put that proboscis under the uh, skin of the tomato. And let's face it, they just throw up a bunch of enzymes uh, under the skin of the uh, tomato. It digests the cells and things and they suck it out like a straw. Once again, there's nothing at all wrong with this tomato. I've eaten many of them before I knew what this was. And I, I don't think I, I look like these. Um, but what I can tell you is if you try to parboil these to get the skin off, it's not gonna work. If you try to, you know, with a paring knife, try to skin them, it's not gonna work. Uh, they stick to that. But the bulk of the tomato is perfectly fine. But that's just another one uh, of those interesting uh, bug stories. Here's one. Uh, the mass chafer, we call them the June bug. Um, maybe earlier in the season, if you have a swimming pool or a fountain or a dog watering dish or anything like that, um, you'll see them floating in there in the morning. They lay their eggs on grass, turf primarily, but not exclusively. They're in your vegetable garden too. And they don't do too much in and of themselves, but their babies do. And here they are, they're called grubs. You've heard that. And not only do the grubs do damage by themselves by eating the roots of the plants, you've got these guys coming in. Because I don't know about if any, many of you have lawn left, I still have some lawn. And right now it's being torn up every single night by raccoons who are looking for these guys. So it's a double whammy in terms of bad bug. Not only do they damage your, your seed, mainly your, your small young plants, but they also uh, are the target for more destructive creatures like the uh, raccoon. This is my last bad bug. And it's really not one actually. It's called an Asian citrus psyllid. And it's, you see, it's a pretty small bug. It is a, a true bug and it sits like this 45 degree angle. She lays her eggs and they uh, hatch into nymphs here with the little red eye. This is honeydew. This is a very distinctive pattern of honeydew, distinctive to this particular psyllid. Now, why is this important other than it's just kind of disgusting looking? Well, the psyllid carries a bacterium and when it feeds, the bacterium gets in the, in the citrus and uh, it causes this Huang Long Bing disease or called citrus greening disease, which is lethal to the tree within five years. And there is no cure at this point. It is virtually decimated the citrus industry in Florida. And of course it's here in California. Where is it in California? You guessed it, Southern California. They have not only the psyllid, but they have the disease there. The reason I'm bringing it up here is because the psyllid, but not the disease, but the, the adult insect has been found in El Sobrante, uh, Pleasant Hill, and last year in San Francisco. So, and those, those uh, areas are under quarantine now but this is a very serious pest. We'll have this uh, website here. This came off the UC uh, IPM website. It's a nice 
uh, informational thing about how to look for this and what to do about it. Because if you see this, uh, you don't just cut this off and throw it in the, in the green waste. So you, you call uh, the Department of Agriculture and they either send somebody out or they tell you what to do and they will deal with uh, uh, rough chemicals on it. So it's a very serious, potentially devastating economic pest. So there you have at least a snapshot of some of the pests around. So what's the solution? Now I would sing this for you, but somebody told me my voice is like a chainsaw cutting up old car bodies. So it wouldn't be pretty. So rather than that, I'll just let you look at this. It was an advertisement in Time Magazine on the year of my birth. And I remember when DDT is a very effective insecticide. And uh, of course, it's been banned for many, many years. But if you go to a garden center, look what you see. We've all done it. You go to any of them and there's lots and lots of uh, insecticides. And, um, and sometimes you need insecticides, but we as master gardeners and others hope or think there's a better solution. And that's a strategy. And I'm not gonna go into great detail about this except for what is in red, which is what I'm talking about, the biological control. But integrated pest management looks at better habitat manipulation, cultural practices, uh, resistant varieties, biological control, and chemical use when required. And here is something you will get a lot of information. It's a great site. Any of the bugs that I talked about already and many of the bugs that I have are on there. If you have a problem in your yard and you can identify the insect, you can go to the IPM website and it'll tell you how to manage it. So that's really useful. So now we're about midway before we get to the good bugs. So why don't we take a break? You can stand up, stretch your legs, get a drink of water or something. And I will try to answer questions if I can. Great, okay, we have a number of them that have come through the chat box. We're gonna take about five minutes for some questions and we have another question and answer session at the end. So if you have questions, please um, put them in your chat box. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, so there are a couple questions. One of the um, couple, uh, one of the, you talked a little bit about grubs. Somebody had a question about grubs in container gardening. Um, is there a way to get rid of grubs in your container gardening soil without having to replace all of the soil? Getting rid of, did you say grubs? Yes, grubs. grubs. You know, in a container, uh, usually, you know, when you, um, you, you have to take them, just pluck them out manually. Literally, you just take them and you squash them or you put them in soapy water. Um, in a small area, it's probably easier to do that. You can disrupt the soil a little bit. They're usually pretty shallow, not always, but they're usually pretty shallow and you'll see them. And then they're not fat, they just lay in there. And then you uh, just throw them in, you either squash them, throw them to your chickens or throw them in soapy water. Uh, for bigger areas, you'd have to go you can use nematodes. Uh, I've never used them myself. Some people claim that they are really uh, a good. It's an acceptable uh, method by UCIPM to use nematodes because they kill uh, the grubs. But sometimes manual uh, um, work is probably as good as anything. Great, thank you. So question about the good bugs and how they do their work in our yard. Somebody had a question about how long do you need to wait to see if the good bugs in your yard will handle all the bad bugs before you need to decide if you need to start spraying? You know, if, if I could kind of hold off on that, because I kind of briefly talk about that uh, when we get to the good bugs. Perfect. We will yeah. do that. And I, but what I will say, it's probably variable. I think you can't, I think it would be very difficult to say, well, uh, seven days or five days or 10 days. I think it'd be difficult to say that. It depends on the extent of the outbreak and what the specific bad bug is, I would say. But we'll, we'll kind of bring that back. And if I don't give you a, suit, a suitable answer, let me know. Okay, fair enough. So um, you showed the coddling moth and talked a little bit about how perfectly fine to eat that fruit, um, cut around it just de depends on uh, what your tolerance level is. What about other fruits that folks find bugs have eaten or laid um, eggs um, in? Are those, are all fruits okay to eat that have been touched by some type of insect? Oh boy, that's a tough one because- I know. Uh, yeah, it's very tough because I don't know about every single thing that um, uh, 
lays eggs in. Most of the time, the, the eggs are laid on the surface. And, and the problem is, is you see the worms or the larva, right? But most of the time, uh, they're on the surface and then the larva go in. I suspect there are some um, insects that would uh, go deep into the fruit. Um, I don't think there's any toxicity associated with it. It's more of a aesthetics thing. If, if, if we probably have all eaten insect eggs and not known about it, if you know about it, it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. So I would have to leave that open because I don't really know, but I don't think, I can't think of an insect that would lay an egg that would have any really adverse effects other than just being kind of disgusting. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Somebody has a question about fava beans that they had saved, dried, um, saying that their bull, that bull weevils um, got into their saved seeds. Um, are the seeds savable or um, are they lost cause? Uh, so them. <laughs> probably not a bull weevil. There are a weevil. Uh, they're probably not a bull weevil though, but that's, that's a moot point, but they're a weevil. I would think that probably they're not very good. Um, uh, kind of depends on where the weevil did its damage. You know, the, it, a fava beans got big fleshy, they call cotyledons, the big, the big bean part of it. But the part that's going to sprout is a little tiny part. So if they, if they punched a hole in the cotyledon, I, I don't think that it would, uh, have that much of a drastic effect, but if it ate the little shoot, it would. Mm -hmm. So unless, but unless you just have a bunch of damage, I, I wouldn't worry. I just throw out the ones that have any sign of the, of, of the boring. I guess that's what I would do. Okay, great. Thank you. Last one before we move on. I know, thank you for all the other questions. We'll make sure we try to get to those um, at our second Q and A at the end. So we had a question about, we talked about, you talked about aphids. They had a question specifically about black aphids on their Swiss chart. How do you prevent or control them? You talked about water as an option. Is that, would that be a good enough uh, source for? Well, there, there's, there's a couple of things. You can prevent them by probably using a, um, oh my, I can't think of the name. Uh, it's a cover, it's a row cover. Mm -hmm. And it lets in uh, air and water and sunlight, but it keeps out uh, creatures. So if you get it early enough before the aphids, you could cover with row cover and keep them off physically. So it's a physical barrier. If it's too late and they're already there, my, my first choice always with aphids is to uh, blast them off with water. That's really effective. When they hit the ground, they don't crawl back. And why, I don't know, but they don't. Now they're, I don't know about that particular aphid, but most aphids, they have a certain fraction of the population that fly. So, you know, you're always gonna have them, you have to keep up on it. But your best bet I think is, is just a, a, a nice healthy stream of water will knock them off. Great, okay. That, that takes our, that's the end of our Q and A. Uh, we have another one, as I said at the end, I'll let you get back to the rest of your talk, John. Thank you. Okay. Andrew, what are these stripes on here? on the picture. Do you I, see them or is that just- Yes, it is. I think it's a little, there's a, there's a little feature you could make draw on Zoom. So I think that's gonna carry forward on all your different slides, but it's okay, not doing any harm. Okay, it's not a big deal, no, not a big deal. So now we're gonna go to the, we're gonna go to the, our favorite favorites, unless you like bad bugs, cause they're neat. Uh, now we're gonna go to the good bugs. And, um, <clears throat> If you're going to, if you like the approach of having good bugs help manage the bad, bad ones, you need to provide a suitable environment, A, to draw them to your garden and to keep them in your garden. Now, wouldn't this be nice if all our gardens look like this? This would be perfect because there's all kinds of flowers and that will draw beneficial insects. And why is that? Here's a, one of the greatest pictures I've ever seen of an insect. This is called a serpent fly. It's called a hoverfly. I'm going to come back to this. It's a fly. It's not a bee, even though it's striped. It's a fly. It has one pair of wings rather than two, if you want to get technical about it. But she is sitting here grasping the anther of this flower, which is the male part of the plant that has the pollen, because she and he only eat pollen as adults. 
but their babies, and I'll show you a picture of them, their babies are voracious eaters of aphids. So you don't have flowers, you won't have this fly, these groups of flies and other insects. So you want to make, it's a win-win. You want a, a, a garden full of uh, flowers that bloom the year round. And so you get the benefit of the, of the flower and you get the benefit of the, uh, of the um, insects. So who are the good bugs if we want to lump them together? Well, there's the pollinators. They don't really have an impact on the bad bugs. They're just our friends and we like to look at them. Then there's the natural enemies, which are the predators and the parasites, both of which I'll talk about. And then, as I mentioned with the praying mantis, some can be neutral, but they would stay. So here are the pollinators. And we all know them. These are uh, some uh, native bees, um, the green sweat bee, the carpenter bee, and I can't remember the name of this bee. Um, it's a white rear-ended bumblebee of some sort. Uh, and then we have the uh, butterflies, which are beautiful pollinators, but remember they produce caterpillars. Then you have the gold standard. This is the lady beetle. And when I grew up, it was called a ladybug. People still call it a ladybug. It's not a bug, but that's neither here or there. Here's something that I'm sure you all are dying to know. This is called a convergent lady beetle. And these two white lines right here, if you can see them, they converge on the midline. That's a, called a convergent lady beetle. That's just one of those things. That's what keeps scientists employed, I guess. But the lady beetle eats lots of aphids. She lays her eggs. The eggs stay there for two to 10 days. Uh, they hatch and boom, you get this. This is quite different. Uh, in the metamorphosis picture, I used this example, but here's a picture of, of the aphid in a real life, or uh, aphid, the, uh, the larva eating an aphid. And we have a, a poster at our markets that shows this. And um, many people have come up and they're horrified because they've squashed that larva because they thought it was bad. There's a bunch of aphids on your roses and you see that thing, you just assume it's a bad guy, but yet it's a good guy. This is my whole mantra about learning the biology of these guys so you understand that these immature forms are the ones that are doing the damage to the aphids and you just kind of have to recognize them. When the larva has eat its way through the aphids, they pupate on the plant, take seven to 15 days, and then uh, an adult comes out. These days, and that's dependent on temperature. It's dependent on the specific species of the lady beetle. There's quite a number of them, but it just gives you a, a rough idea of the time it, it takes. Here's another really neat bug. And I have to say that when I was a young man, I didn't know better and I sprayed my aphids with malathion and others, I would see one of these fly by and I'd spray it too. Uh, I've since learned that this is one of our friends. It's called a lace bug for obvious reasons. The wing is very lacy looking. The, uh, she lays her eggs on very delicate stalks. You see the little tiny stalks here and the, and, the, and the egg at the end of it. And where did she lay those eggs? Right near the aphid buffet here and here. And when those eggs hatch, this is what you get. Now, once again, if you didn't know that, you would assume maybe that this is a bad guy just because he looks bad. He looks prehistoric. Um, the lacewing larva eats aphids like crazy, eats uh, white fly um, nymphs uh, and eggs and other uh, uh, small sucking insects and so forth. So it's a really good guy to have in your garden. The ground beetle. If you go out in your yard tomorrow and you go uh, uh, kick up the mulch a little bit or around your uh, compost pile, you'll see these guys. That's the adult, obviously. The baby looks nothing like mom. Look at these mandibles, these sharp, that's their mouth parts. Very prehistoric looking. And both adult and larva, they eat the larva and the pupa of other guys, preferably bad guys. So once again, if you didn't know that and you just saw this black beetle scurrying around, you might not like him because you don't know that he's good and you might uh, give him the sole of your shoe. But he's actually a really good guy to have in your garden. These are the serpent flies, the hover flies. And they're just four different 
a subspecies of the same type of fly. And you see they're all striped in different patterns. They're small, they're less than half an inch. Here's your homework assignment if, if you're so inclined on this. If you have flowers in your garden, go out tomorrow. I guarantee you, you'll find these there hovering over your flowers. They hover just like a helicopter and then they zoom away. I can go out every single day and find them in my garden. And uh, they zoom around, they hover over looking for aphids and they lay their egg. And this is what is the larva looks like. You wouldn't know that that is related to that. And they eat aphids like crazy. And I put this bottom picture here of a yellow rose just with a surfeit fly larva there to highlight it. If you saw that, the first impression might be to squeeze it because you, you think it's eating the plant. It's not eating the plant. It's there because there's aphids somewhere. So this, these are really good guys. And uh, there are lots of data out there showing that if lady beetles, which are your first line of defense for aphids, I guess, if they're not plentiful for whatever reason, these guys come in in, in, in high numbers and help uh, take care of the, the aphid population. This is a soldier beetle. I'm afraid I've squashed more than my share of those before I knew what I was doing. And the adult soldier beetle eats aphids. You know, aphids are like popcorn or Cheetos uh, to the, in the insect world. They're fast food and, these, and everybody loves them, I guess. So the adult uh, soldier beetle loves to eat aphids, but her baby doesn't look anything like her, likes to eat eggs of other insects. This happens to be a conspers stink bug, which I was in the bad group of bad bugs. So uh, here you have the adults eating the adults and the babies eating the babies. So that's, it's a win-win. So this is a really good um, uh, positive beneficial insect to have in the garden. If I say wasp, most people probably their first, their first reaction is to think about the yellow jacket or the hornet or one of those bad guys who can put a good sting on you. But when I'm talking good bugs, I'm talking about parasitic wasps. This is one of the biggest groups of uh, insects there is. Some people think there's a half a, a million different species of these guys worldwide. They're little tiny wasps. They're less than a quarter of an inch long. Can they sting? Well, yeah, they can, but it's really unlikely they're so small because the stinger here, 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 and here is the way they deposit their eggs. It's called an ovipositor. It's a, so they, uh, they're hollow and they uh, deposit their eggs through that, that stinger, if you will. So what do they sting? What do they do? Where do they lay their eggs? Well, they lay their eggs in bad guys. They lay their eggs in caterpillars, uh, here's one getting stung, and here's one about to get stung. There's the ovipositor up here, and that big guy's going to get it here in just a minute. So what happens? Well, they deposit their egg inside the caterpillar, and the egg hatches into a larva. And the larva then crawls around on the inside of that creature and eats its way and to, uh, through its uh, further development. Nature is a cruel thing sometimes. But the, then the wasp emerges from uh, the subsequently dead uh, caterpillar. To give you an idea of size of some of these, y'all, everybody knows an aphid. These are aphids here. This is a wasp laying an egg in an aphid. So what happens? And it reminds me of the old alien movie with Sigourney Weaver, uh, because it's very much like that. The wasp develops inside the aphid. This is a parasitized aphid. Look at how swollen it is, because there's a fully formed adult wasp in there who finally eats its way out, just like the alien. And this is called an aphid mummy. And you see the hole here, a fully developed wasp came out of that hole. So if you think about the size of an aphid and that the wasp had to develop inside, you get an idea of um, the, uh, how tiny these things are. 
Remember the coddling moth? That's the moth that lays the worm that goes into the apple. And you can imagine how small her eggs are. And here is a parasitic wasp laying its egg on a coddling moth egg. So they're tiny, tiny, tiny wasps. Here's another one laying its eggs in one of the other bad bugs that I mentioned, the green, green stink bug. Now, does this wasp lay its egg in every single egg there, every single stink bug egg? No. The beneficial insects keep the bad bugs down to a level that can be more manageable, but they don't eradicate usually 100%. You are going to have aphids. You're going to have some of these other things, but the beneficial insects will really help keep the population um, uh, manageable. Here is um, the last slide I have on the good bugs. And this is the last thing of the parasitic wasps. This is the green uh, tomato worm. And this is a, I don't know what kind he is, but he's kind of orange and furry. And um, the wasp lay their eggs on or under the skin and the wasp larva then crawls around on the inside of the worms, eating the insides. And the worm is not yet dead, but it's not doing any damage. It's just kind of comatose. Then when the wasps are ready to finish their development, they crawl outside of the worm and they make their pupil cases, the little cocoon things on the surface of the worm. And out from these pupil cases are, um, come the adult wasps. So once again, it's kind of a harshness of nature, but it is a very effective way that beneficial insects have adapted to take care of the bad guys. So what would she make of all of this? And you know, as I was sitting here, I realized I didn't answer that person's question about how long it takes for um, the beneficial insects to affect a significant decrease. I would say this is, um, when I did it, it was a week that I went from a high aphid infestation to very few. There were still some, but a significant uh, reduction. So it, it's relatively rapid once it gets going. The question is, can you handle aphids on your plant for, for that long? So I hope that answered that question. Here's another last little uh, group of pictures of some beautiful insects. And so what's the bottom line from all of this that we've gone through? Um, the take home message number one is make beneficial insects feel at home. And that was the thing of having flowers for them, having mulch for them, having a food source for them, realizing that the adults um, need the flowers, but their babies are carnivorous and they're gonna eat the bad guys. So you wanna make the good guys feel at home. And it's a, as I said before, it's a win-win because you're gonna be providing all sorts of flowers for them throughout the season. Switching from pesticides to biological control probably will result in an upswing in pests for a while. And I guess I was premature in my uh, answering that last question because here's where the time, because. It's going to be somewhat variable, as I said, depending on so many factors, but it's usually days to a week where you're gonna see a significant decrease in, in the population of the pests. And, but as I said, you are not gonna get rid of all of them. So if, if it's unacceptable, if your tolerance level is surpassed and you go, you know, I gave the lady beetles a chance and the, and the uh, um, um, soldier beetles and all those, and they couldn't deal with it. Well, then you can go to somewhat le le more benign, not completely benign, but the oils and the soaps, they, they do have some effect on the beneficials, but not like the, the bad bugs. And these are, are, are safe for us. If you get this on you, it's quite different than if you get some of the petroleum-based insecticides where you better wash it off because they have the potential of toxicity. These are pretty benign things. But there are, uh, science has, has come along and there are very specific, and I, I use safer um, in quotes, uh, safer uh, pesticides. 
And uh, I'm not going to read this to you. You can read it yourself. But these are bacterial-based products that uh, are specific for certain types of insects. Like the first one, you, if you go to, to, the, to a store and you look for B, uh, BT, it's there. BTK is one that can, uh, controls leaf-feeding caterpillars. And that's all it controls. The, uh, the BTI only controls mosquitoes and fungus gnats. Uh, the coddling moth virus only controls coddling moth. Now those, so you can use those pretty safely. It's not gonna damage anything else except those, those critters. This uh, spinosad is one that's used in organic uh, farming. It's acceptable by all the organic uh, regulatory organizations. Uh, and it's specific for those creature, uh, critters here, uh, caterpillars, leaf miners and thrips, which I didn't talk about, but they're bad guys. But this one will kill honeybees. So you have to be very careful how you use it. If you use it first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening when the bees are not out, it can have an effect, uh, a positive effect on um, some of your um, uh, fruits and vegetables. So, and so my plea is uh, give the good guys a try. And I think you'll be happy that you did. And I hope that you learned just a little bit more about insects maybe than you knew before and that, and that you maybe appreciate them a little bit more. They're a fascinating group of, of critters and I hope you'll go out in the garden and take a look, for, a look uh, uh, and see if you can find them. You'll find the beneficials, they're there. So I wanna thank you for your attention and I will answer the questions that I can. Thanks. And um, for those of you who want to stay on, we'd love to um, take a little bit more of John's time, if that's okay, John, and uh, have a few more questions. No, I'd love to. I'm sorry that I ran a little long. I guess I got a little long-winded a few times. So I no, it's, it's all such great stuff. And there's a lot of folks who are very interested in um, one question. There's a couple questions about ladybugs. One, of, one interesting question is, can you transfer ladybug larva to a different plant that needs more aphid control? Oh, I would think sure, absolutely. Yeah, if you can just carefully do it, well, you know, they're very fragile things, but they're not so fragile that you can't, you know, pick them up with a leaf or a stick or something. Yeah, absolutely, you could do that. Great, okay. So somebody had a question. If ladybugs run out of food, will they move on and leave your yard and come back in the future? Yes, they will. Okay. You know, a lot of people want to buy ladybugs um, and it's a great thing for children. Um, but oftentimes if you open up the container, off they go and they'll go to wherever um, the food is. And uh, it may be in your yard, it may be in the neighbor's yard. So, uh, you know, if you buy them, if you just want to do it for kids for the, to see them so they can see the, the beetles and watch them fly, that's one thing. But you might be disappointed if you think they're all going to stay there. Yeah. So get, getting to that, is, is a balance of good bugs and bad bugs needed to keep kind of pest activity in your garden under control? Say that again. Do you really need a, both those good bugs and bad bugs in your yard to keep pest activity under control? Is a balance of both needed? So should you keep some of the bad bugs around? Uh... Well, yeah, that's a tough call, isn't it? Because the bad bugs feed the good ones. Um, I know, right. If you don't have any bad ones, the good ones won't be there, you know. Um, but I think most people would probably say, I'll take no aphids, even if that means no ladybugs. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's kind of a tough one. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to your tolerance. <laughs> yeah, really. So... Going back to, um, I guess, a neutral bug, praying mantis. So what do you do if you come across that um, large green creature in your garden? Uh, I leave them be. Uh, I leave them be. Now, I guess uh, it's, a, it's a tough one because they're going to take anything that they can take. And so if you're, if you're worried about uh, honeybees, for instance, or other kind of bees, and you have a lot of them, you think that, he, it's, that he's going to destroy them, well, then you got to... What are you going to do with them? You either got to destroy him or move him somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, the, the thing about the birds, you know, you can keep them, keep an eye on them. That's 
you know, in the whole world, there was 147 cases. So it's not like it's everywhere. So it's probably not a major deal, but keep your eye out for them. I like having them in the yard, but I understand that they're going to take some things that I like because they also are, are tremendous eaters and they'll eat everything. And uh, unfortunately, they'll eat lizards. They'll eat, um, well, the birds, but but any kind of bad bug they'll eat. Uh, they'll eat black widow spiders, um, everything. So I would I would keep them in the yard, but that, that's a personal preference if, you know, because they are going to eat something, uh, something good too. Okay, good. Um, question about neem oil. Somebody uh, had asked, what are the different uses for neem oil, what appropriate uses of, and is there, what are the downsides or what are, are there any downsides? The downside is you could, in theory, you could suffocate some of the beneficial insects. That's one downside. Uh, the other downside, probably the most significant one is any oil, whether it's neem oil or a horticultural oil or stylet oil. If you happen to spray it and then it jumps up to 95, 96, 97 degrees, you can burn the plant. Uh, it, it can cause some burning. If you by chance used a, um, a sulfur containing compound, uh, it's a bad reaction with, I, I'm pre, I know with stiletto, I'm not absolutely sure with neem oil, but I think so. You gotta be careful mixing an oil with sulfur if you use sulfur in any other context. So those would be the downsides, I think. Um, I, there, it's not toxic to us. I mean, if you get it on you, it's an oil, you know, it's a, it's an agri it's a plant oil. So I don't think there's any particular danger to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think mainly the, the sun scalding and it, would, it will in theory suffocate some, uh, some larva, so, uh, some uh, beneficial larva. Okay, good. Well, I know we had some other questions, but that unfortunately is all we have time for this evening. I do encourage you to reach out to our help desk if you live in Contra Costa County um, or find one in your local area if you're joining us from outside. And John, thank you again so much. This was a wonderful program um, and I hope everyone joined it. And thank you for those who um, participated on live streaming. So we, we appreciate everyone coming to our program this evening.